to share with you just for a moment, friends and foes, not or, and friends and foes, the inevitable life of a Jesus follower. Um, how many Jesus followers here today? Anybody a Jesus follower? I want to go to John chapter 15 again. We're going to start at verse 12 and read through to verse 21. And then we'll go from there and look at this text. And there's a few things we want to bring out on this evening. The Lord showed himself in a mighty way this morning. The spirit of the Lord was in this place. And um, I'm grateful for that. And so I want to read this text now. I'm reading from actually the King James Version of the Bible. I believe. No, New, New King James. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I, choose, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things that, will, that they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. I'm sorry. I'm so, oh, yeah, okay, I'm right. So the question again, the question I have for you as we read this text, not again, I asked, are there any Jesus followers? But I asked the question, really, are you a Jesus admirer or a Jesus follower? And there's a big difference between the Jesus admirer. They find themselves mired in confusion. They find themselves uh, in conundrums. They find themselves perplexed by the things of this world. But those who bow before the cross recognize that there is a challenge and a burden that we must bear. And we recognize that we are in the end times and there are some challenges before us. But as we look at that, I see that there are three imperatives for the follower of Christ if you are a follower. I pray you're not just an admirer. Jesus don't need admirers and fans. He need people to follow him. And these three imperatives are very important because many people who are saved are blindsided by these things. And it's important for me to share them with you just for a few moments on this evening. The three imperatives for the follower of Christ, if you are followers, first of all, follow God's command to love. And then the second thing is to recognize that we are friends with God. We're not just servants. And then we might recognize more so that if we follow his command to love, we are friends with God, that you will be hated by the world. I need you to know, my brothers and sisters, that the world will hate you. And we'll look at that in just a few moments. Let's start first by following God's commandment. We live in a day where many people um, are, are find themselves kind of... Um, dismissing themselves from the New Testament and just go to the Old Testament and they look at Christianity and say that we're wrong because we don't follow the commandments of God. They start with beers. They start with days that you worship. They start with the word that you use to, to, to call God. What is the name that you use to call God? And, and many people in many different sects and different places say you're not following God's commandments if you're not following the laws of Moses. But, the, the, but this commandment is given to God and is often and is given often in the New Testament. And uh, the commandment is that you love one another. This is not just an, a suggestion. 
This is a commandment known as the great commandment. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said that you will love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You will love your neighbor as yourself. The commandment to love one another is all throughout the New Testament, but just a few times. First, we see it emphatically stated in verse 12. He said, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And so we're to love each other like Jesus loved us. And I don't know about you, but Jesus loved me when I was a mess. Jesus didn't wait until I got it together. Jesus didn't wait until I seemed to do all right. Jesus didn't wait until I cleaned up and was articulate and acceptable before he loved me. He loved me when I was unlovable. Jesus loved me. I don't know about you. Jesus loved me before uh, many others would love me. Jesus loved me before I even could see my potential. And if Jesus loved me in this way and he said, love others as I have loved you, we should love each other in the same way. Not just because somebody has a fiery testimony, not just because somebody has been beautifully saved, not just because somebody uh, can do great things and walk in talent. But even before we see their potential, we should love them. You've often heard me say that it's important that we love the hell out of people. Yes, love the hell out of people. Because oftentimes we can be carrying hell and carrying things and hurt and pain and all kinds of things. But love pushes away. Love uh, covers a multitude of sin. 1 John chapter 4 verse 11 to 12. I've quoted it often but I'll read it here. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. We cannot, we live in a time where we are tempted. We are tempted to isolate ourselves from other humans. We're tempted to isolate ourselves from individuals, to hide behind whether it's social media, to hide behind our busyness, to hide behind the animals that we love, to hide behind all kinds of things, and we don't interact with humans as much. Even people choose to text instead of talking. Even people choose to just, and instead of, even when you text, they don't even talk back to you anymore. You say, how are you doing? They just press like, and that was supposed to have been a response. We don't even respond to each other and don't even reach out to each other. But I'm here to tell you that people need love. We need love, affection, and human interaction. As a matter of fact, if you had a healthy baby that was born, and that healthy baby uh, was born and everything is right and you lay it down on the table and you can provide some apparatus to make sure it gets milk on time. But without human touch, without some human love, that baby will die. There are many of us that are dying right now. We're walking around. We're still breathing. We're still living, but we're dying because we don't have that interaction with other humans. God meant for us to interact with each other. And I know that I hear people say that I'm private. I'm, I have social anxiety. I'm shy. All of that is from the devil. Some of us are more talkative than others, but we all need to be loved. And we got to find how to love one another. If it's just a how you doing, a hug, a handshake, a look in the eye, to check up on somebody, a call sometimes, a voice on the other side of the line, somebody who's looking out for you, somebody who just asks, how are things going? And how did, how did it go what I prayed for you for to cover you in prayer? We need love. The Bible says here in 1 John, no one is seeing God. And if we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. In other words, if we don't love one another, then we do not have the power of God. And then finally, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25, it says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. We consider each other and stir up love and good works by being near each other. I was blessed that earlier today there were many that signed up to be able to go show love to total strangers in the community. But one thing I found about the church that's interesting is that sometimes we can be very loving to people who are outside of the church but not loving to people inside the church. Sometimes we can be very understanding to sinners and people on the street but very short with each other. 
I would say to you that it's just as important to give love to one another. We're easy to cut people off and easy to write them off, and I'm never going to talk with them again. I don't want them to sink in my section. If you are alto, go become a soprano because I don't even want you over here. But no, we need to be with each other, and we need to recognize that to love one another doesn't mean that we always agree. To love one another don't mean that we always, that we all share the exact same like. Somehow in the world, the world has made us think that we will have soulmates that agree with everything, like the same movies and like to do the same things. And look at here, my wife and I love each other, but we don't like none of the same movies and most not of the same food, but we love each other. And those differences make us greater together. Quit looking for some fairy tale and to make the fairy tale yourself that two opposite people from opposite places, from opposite things can come together and strengthen one another. Many times we talk about diversity and people talk about diversity and they, 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 we've been made stupid to look at diversity only as skin color or ethnicity. But diversity also applies, if you really have diversity, you can have diversity of thought. Yeah, that's the greater diversity that we think different and see things different. Now, as we're saved, we should not be speaking the same language, but we can have diversity of thought. I see things different, but I can still love you. And it continues to say, let us stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting or encouraging one another. And so much the more as you see the day Approaching. In other words, we consider and stir up love. We don't, we stir up things in love. We build one another up. And this is why we come together. This lie of the devil that tells us that we don't have to come to church and we can go worship in the forest or we can worship sitting on a corner or we can go under a tree or we can be at home by ourselves and worship is a lie from the devil because we build one another up through love and stirring up good works. And when we assemble together, we're built up. This is a command of God. You can't love me if you don't see me, if you're not around me. You can't love me worshiping under a tree in a forest somewhere on top of a mountain, but it's us coming together. We come together to worship God and we leave to go and serve. We got, must follow God's commandment to love one another. This is not the only scripture that's there. There are other scriptures that command us to love one another, and it's important. Second John 1 5 says, And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I write like, as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning that we love one another. Romans 13 8 says, Oh no one. This is why we don't, listen, let me tell you something. This is why we shouldn't be loaning money all over the church. Amen. That's why we got a disciple assistance fund. Don't be loaning money. I told y'all don't be loaning money. Some, some folks didn't come to church now because they owe somebody some money. Owe no one anything except to love another. You owe me to love me. You don't owe me $20. Except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, this is a good scripture to remember when somebody asks you, are you fulfilling the law? Romans 13, 8. Are you fulfilling the law? Are you walking in the law? Romans 13, 8 says that if I love you, I'm fulfilling the law. No matter what day I'm in church, no matter how long my beard is, hallelujah, I'm fulfilling the law. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. In other words, they're saying, I'm an example of love. I'm showing you how we love other people. I'm showing you how we love individuals, and may you do the same. Maybe you eat uh, pork chops. You break in whatever they say the law is, but you're loving people. You're fulfilling the law. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Hallelujah, somebody. Uh, then we got to remember, as we love God, we got to know that then the second point that I had is that we are friends of God. God is not some cosmic boss waiting in heaven to just push us to make sure we don't do have any fun and do anything. He just said we, when he told us to love one another, we must love one another just as he loved us. And then he says in John 15, 15, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. A servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, 
For all things that I heard from you, from my father, excuse me, all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. Wait a minute. God doesn't just call us his servants. He calls us his friends. He considers us friends. And this will change many of our theology. Maybe we'll pray even more that when we go to pray to God, we're going to talk as a friend to another friend. As a matter of fact, Exodus chapter 33, verse 11, right about verse 11, it said, Moses talked to God face to face as a friend to another friend. We should go to God, not as some, some scary man who's going to throw lightning bolts down and rain thunder upon us. He considers us friends. Why? Because a servant or a slave doesn't know what the master is doing. Let's take away that word slave, an employee. There's a difference between an employee relationship and an and a, 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 a owner or a, 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 a high shareholder. The employees don't know always the vision of the company and don't know every thing that's going to happen. We just on a need to know basis. What needs to be done today? What needs to happen? That's all we need to know. But when you're in that upper level of ownership and management, then you know what's happening, where we're going, what the plans are. He's saying to us, I call you my friends because the things that we don't spend time talking with the little servants about. We don't spend time talking with the little slaves. You know everything that I'm going to do. You're not surprised that we're in the last days. You're not surprised at what's happening around you because I already told you these things that Jesus when he comes back the Bible tells us I'm coming as a thief in the night and be surprised but those who are of faith will not be surprised we won't be surprised when the rapture comes because we already know and he's already told us what to look for we're not gonna say oh my goodness the rapture came in I was left like the sister last week that preached and it reenacted that she was left behind in the rapture that would not be our story because he's already told us as friends. And then we see, have mercy, then we see uh, in verse 16, uh, in verse 16 of that chapter, I left my Bible. Can somebody pull that up for me? Verse 16 of Romans 15. Let me see here. I can pull it up myself. Verse 16. Help me, Jesus. Not to get that. There we go. I want to read it and I want to just quote it verse 16 here says uh, right that I may that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel that uh, yeah ministering the gospel uh, that might be a minister that I'm right yeah, I'm, okay, I'm in the right place. Thank you. I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified of the Holy Spirit. In verse 16, he has given us uh, power of attorney. He's given us power of attorney. Nevertheless, uh, going up to verse 15, 16, 17, it tells us that whatever we ask in his name, we shall accomplish. I'm sorry, I said Romans, that should be John. That's why we're off. There we go. John 15, 16. There we go. All right. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. Jesus, because we are his friends, he has given us power of attorney. Oh, that's where I want to get to just for a moment. Uh, now, you understand power of attorney. That's somebody that you trust, that you've given the ability to speak on your behalf in court or in your business affairs. They can, in your name, sign contracts. They can, in your name, make deposits and withdrawals as power, that when they have power of attorney. When Jesus said he our friend he didn't just say it willy-nilly but he said you're such my friend that you can come in my name and and come and work on my behalf and sign on my behalf you can ask whatever you want and pull from the estate because I consider you friends employees don't get that uh, opportunity individuals from the streets don't get that opportunity and he said but these things I command you that you love 
one another. This is power of eternity. The power of, and then this is a power. He gave us power of attorney. And then in verse 17, he gave us power to love one another. Jesus is our friend. And because he's our friend, he's given us authority that belongs to him. He said, all authority has been given unto me. And now I give it unto you as my friend. Hallelujah. So we recognize that we are commanded to love one another, but also not only to command to love one another, Another, we are commanded to uh, we are remanded to be the friends of God and then finally my final point which I'm gonna lay in just for a, a little bit more that the true friends of God now that we're friends of God have the character of God and if we are the friends of God who have the character of God that this vexes the world this causes a problem in the world because we reflect the character of God I just put it like this. When you become friends with someone, especially someone of authority or someone with influence, their friends become your friends and their enemies become your enemies. That many times because of your association with an individual, their friends become your friends and their enemies become your enemy. You with somebody, you can, you gotta, that's why you got to watch who you're around because they can have some very powerful enemies that you may not want to have. Well, since we're friends with God, we also find ourselves that we are an enemy with the world. And we say the world, we don't mean just in everybody in the world, but the world system, the world itself. Jesus said in verse 18, Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And this is where a lot of people get stuck. We understand that we should love one another. People that have been saved for 10 minutes know you're supposed to love me. There are people not even saved like, wait, you're a Christian, you're supposed to love me. And it's not even so hard to understand that we're friends with God. We see that, we're, we're friends with God. But sometimes it's hard to wrap around our head that we can be the enemies of God, of the world, of the world, that the world hates us. He didn't say dislikes us, but the world, if the world, Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Did you know that the world hates you? Some of us are still wondering why there's people that don't like you. There's people that, now I'm not just talking about, I'm not talking to those who are petty and messy. I'm not talking to those who just talk too much. I'm not talking to those who got uh, personality issues and you're always picking with people. I'm talking to some folks, you've been minding your own business, doing all you know to be right and trying to be kind. And all of a sudden you get blindsided from family members, get blindsided from neighbors. And there's folks that come against you and you get depressed and down wondering why is this happening? We we are the friends of God and enemies to the world. I need to just stay here just for a few moments to remind you that you're enemy to the world. Well, somebody would ask the question, why me? We ask that question. How am I enemy to the world? Why me? And it seems like I'm being, uh, what do they call it? Microaggressions of persecution. Little things picking with me. Little things that come against me. And because it seems like yeah, God is moving in my life, but there's some things that come against me. I want to go to some reasons of why. Why does the world hate you? Why does the world hate you and I if we really are the children of God? But I want to, I want to just say this. There's a book that I just finished reading, and it's a phenomenal book by Matt Walsh. It's called Christian Cowards. Oh, yeah, it's a phenomenal book about Christian cowards. It's a phenomenal book because it talks about how in the first chapter, I got to give you this illustration. In the first chapter, it said that many people are afraid that there's some, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. And, uh, in the first chapter, it talks about how there are many people who um, are afraid that some, some heathens from overseas somewhere are going to come to the shores of America and kill Christians. Like, oh my goodness, we got to have security so that people don't come to America to kill the Christians. And so he says that the heathens from somewhere, he doesn't name a religion or ethnicity or where they come from, come on the shores, they come off a ship and they had their swords drawn and their guns drawn to come and kill Christians. And then they go and they start looking for Christians and the first thing they see is an abortion clinic and they go inside and and 
they see that they're dismembering bodies in, the, in a woman. And they say, well, this can't be where the Christians are. But then they see people calling themselves Christian, protecting that happening. And then they go down the street and they see all kinds of people dressed all kinds of ways and all kind of debauchery. And this can't be it. And so they say, let's go find a church and we'll find the Christians. And they get to a place and they get, there's no cross, there's no sign that it's Christian. And they come inside and the music is, is worldly and the people are worldly and the preacher is cool and the preacher gets up and he gives a message and they say, we're going to get a Christian now. As soon as he mentions the Christian message, we'll kill him. But all he talks is motivational speaking and wonderful platitudes. And they said, this is not Christian. So they go to the church down the street and the pastor is a lesbian and the pastor is talking about God is loving of everybody. This can't be Christian. They go to another church because they're looking for Christians to kill. They're looking for Christians to get because the world is an enemy to Christians and they find this church is real dry. It's all dead. It's mainly just old people there. Their children and grandchildren are not there. They're barely going through the motions and they really don't when they, they talk about God but they really seem to not care. And This can't be the place and so then they go out and they say well here's what we're gonna do uh, we can't find Christians anywhere but here's what we'll do we'll go arrest all those pastors and just randomly grab leaders of these churches and we're gonna round them up and we'll kill the Christians and when then they round up people from the churches they went to and they said we're gonna kill you because you Christians I'm gonna kill you so we want you to 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 to, to denounce the Bible and then one of them say, the Bible, no, that's an old book, and it has so many inaccuracies, and we don't fully believe everything. We don't like what Paul said, and so we don't have to denounce the Bible because we're not there. They said, wait a minute, that's not Christian. Then they said, well, no, we want you to denounce Jesus as God. And then one of them, one of the preachers said, well, we believe there's many ways to God, and Jesus is not the only way, and, and we believe this, and, and we, don't, we don't have to denounce Jesus as God. We never said Jesus was the only way to God. And then they said, no, here's what you do. You denounce your faith in the Christian faith. And then once again, some mumble jumble. And then they said, we want you to denounce that, the, that, that, that Christianity is the way to God and we're going to kill you. And they said, well, we're not going to kill anybody. And then finally, there was a hundred people there. And then finally, this is, I'm paraphrasing the whole chapter of the book. And then finally, one man raises his hand. He says, I believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that the Bible is true. I believe that Jesus is the only way to God. And I believe that man if he sins goes to hell and must be saved with a savior and he will go to heaven I believe and I'm willing to die for this and I'm willing to die to tell you that God sent his son and he rose again from the dead and I'm here to tell you that there's only one way to God and his name is Jesus and they said we finally found a Christian we're going to kill you and then the other people said do not kill him he does not represent us he's not a Christian he's a fanatic he's an extremist he's an evangelical we don't believe none of that and they just walked away and they said these people are not even worth killing <laughs> and this is what Matt was said y'all got excited about the brother the other people said he's not even one of us he's not a Christian he's not enlightened he must not be educated he must not have been around and he said the heathen if he walked off the shores of somewhere and walked through America would say that the Christian is not even worth hating or killing because what is purported as Christianity is a joke. I told you when I was in the Middle East just recently, they, 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 look, they say they're the, they're the righteous center of the world because if you look at what they're doing over there, or the, what the so-called Christians are doing, these people are crazy. But real Christians, there's a challenge. And here's why the world hates real Christians. The world hates real Christians. Uh, here's why. The first reason why is that Jesus predicted that the world would hate us. We saw that in verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him 
who sent me. Jesus predicted that we would be hated by the world. They said that, and he said, a servant is not greater than his master. Since they persecuted Jesus, they will also persecute you. Those microaggressions that I talked about are many. And then there's some real aggressions. But he continues to tell us that, listen, if you were of the world, the world would love you. If you were of the world, how many of you found out that when you were of the world, nobody, many of the people who were bothering you now weren't bothering you then? When you spent all your money on your frat, when you spent all your money on your boo, when you spent all your money on your liquor, when you spent all your money on your weed, when you spent all your time doing things that was crazy, you would drive from city to city for a concert following the same group. You would hang out with crazy folks, stay out all night and go to work. Nobody was telling you to slow down. Nobody was telling you was doing wrong. Nobody was telling you to, oh, you're doing the wrong thing. But as soon as you came to God, I don't know if that's your testimony. Am I talking to anybody? As soon as you came to God and got some sense, they laughed at you. They had a problem with you. You're doing too much for God. You're giving your money over there to the preacher. They don't understand vision. As long as you was talking about black power and you was giving to organizations that wasn't doing nothing for black people, nobody said nothing. But as soon as you gave your tithe, as soon as you you said I'm going to pray. Am I talking to anybody here? All of a sudden folks had a problem because when you were of the world, when you were blind and stupid, the world loved it because misery loves company. Because remember hell was not created for you anyway. So the demons were happy that you was going to hell. But now all of a sudden when you came to God, they all of a sudden got a problem. This is what Jesus was talking about. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The worst thing a Christian could do is to walk around talking about, I don't know why they don't like me. What do I need to do for them to like me? Go ahead and get high. They're going to act like they like you again. Go ahead and lay down with somebody. They're going to act like they like you again. And the funny thing is they're going to suck you up, use you up, and spit you out. I know I'm telling the truth. Go ahead and start acting like a thug again. Go ahead and abuse your children and don't pay them no attention. They'll like you then. Cuss them out. Cuss a little bit. Act a little ratchet. They're really like, then you cool. Then you, then they fit in and then you okay and some of us we fall for it some of us we fall for it because it's been said that our ethnicity is equal equal with being ratchet our ethnicity is ghetto and sinful you can't be saved in black you can't be saved in white you can't be saved in America you got to act like they do on tv so the world hates you Another reason why the world hates you, because the world hates reproof, or should I say the world hates correction. John chapter 3 verse 19 says, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Don't you know that there are people that hate the fact that you live in right, because it makes them look bad. There are people who have spent a lifetime there are people who spent a lifetime convincing themselves that their lifestyle and their life choices and their life decisions are correct. They've been working at overriding their conscience. They've tried to override what they think, and they've, they've convinced themselves that it's right. And then here you come saying that God pulled you out of it. They said, once you gay, you're going to be gay forever. They say, once you are drunk, you are drunk forever. Once you are a criminal, you're going to be a criminal forever. They said, once you're a hoe, you're always going to be a hoe. They said, once you, once you, once you this way, once you that way, this is how you're going to be. And you got the nerve to say that God delivered me. Oh, Lord, it reproves them. It causes them to have to override what they have spent their whole life trying to make, convince themselves that they're okay. I can't get fixed. I can't be right because I came from a dysfunctional home. But now you can testify. My home was dysfunctional, but now I'm functional. I used to be a thug, but now I'm a believer. And the the world hates reproof because the world loves their darkness. And when you come in, you shine in too much light. That's why them old friends don't like you no more. I 
know she was your best friend. I know he was your boy. But now you coming around and you speak a different language now. And they're not comfortable with that. Now you coming around. And even if you don't speak a lot about Jesus, you got hope in your eyes. You got promise in your eyes. And they don't like that because you used to look down and felt like a nobody. But now you feel like ain't nothing you can't do. And they can see the light of God all over you. And it causes them, they don't hate you. You've made them hate themselves because they're not happy with where they are. Somebody will just say, Lord, deliver them. But you need to tell them, I don't think I'm better than you. I don't think I'm higher than you because what he's done for me, he can do for you. But I'm here to tell you the bad news that everybody will not accept it. Because the world hates reproof. They're trying in this world to make us perpetual victims. And I refuse to be a perpetual victim. I refuse to walk in the room and it's full of white people and feel like I'm nothing. No, well, come on now. Oh, they looking at me funny. No, y'all be looking at me funny. I walk in, you just as black as me. I refuse to walk in the room and think everybody racist. I refuse to walk in the room and think because you a woman, everybody gonna push you down. I refuse to be a victim. And when you refuse to be a victim, the people that you think are your friends are mad because you're no longer a victim. I walk in any room. How you doing? Nice to meet you. How you doing? Hey, nice to see you. I don't walk in the room and say, oh, it's a bunch of white people. I was the only black person there. They told me nothing. I went to Walmart. I didn't know I was the only black person in the Walmart. I walk through the Walmart, just strolling through. And if, if somebody would follow me, hey, how you doing? Can I help you? <laughs> Let me help you find something. Don't bother me. Hallelujah. And when you got that kind of confidence, the world don't like confidence because the devil has stripped. Everybody who serves the devil has been stripped. They've been stripped of their godly confidence. They've been stripped. Everything else is fake. And now here you are reproving them without saying a word. Hallelujah. Oh, I kind of got ahead of myself because the other reason is their evils are exposed by Christian living. Titus 2 verse 11 through 12 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. See, see if you really save, you, you, you deny ungodliness. Do you ever fall? You fall. But as soon as you fall, oh, my goodness, it's kind of like that person. You know, you dress real nice and, and you get something. You, you ever wear an all-white outfit? Anybody here got on all-white? Oh, yeah, y'all got on white. You got on all-white. You wear an all-white outfit and you get something on it. Oh, no, I don't need that on me. You, you want to stay clean. Am I, am I talking to anybody? You want to stay clean. Okay, let me get off the outfit and get on your sneakers, all right? Uh, your sneakers, I see y'all, some of y'all walk gingerly because you don't want them dirty. You want them clean all the time. You don't even want creases in them. Hallelujah. You don't even want creases in them. What a godly walk and say, I want to stay clean. I don't, I don't want a lot of marks all over me. So it don't mean I don't get dirty, but when I get dirty, I wipe it off. I clean myself off. And when I do that, the evil are exposed for their dirty living because they dingy, they dirty, they nasty. And then they come next to you and you shining. So this is why they hate you. The other thing is Christians are not of this world. You're not a part of the wolf pack. <laughs> John 15, 19 says, and we read it, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you because you are not like them. Now, the funny thing is, I was that wolf. You were that wolf. You are a ravenous carnivore, a flesh-eating mad animal that would hunt something down and kill it. Don't say you wasn't that, but the beautiful thing is that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. He transformed you into something totally different. You ain't ugly with yellow teeth and fangs hanging out your mouth no more. You don't have blood on your, on your fur of who you've killed anymore. You've become something totally different, and they can't understand how you used to be in the wolf pack, but now you're walking upright and circumspect they can understand how you used to be like this and they want to remind you that this is you and you say that was me but that's me no more hallelujah he it's not that I'm a better wolf I'm a whole nother creation <laughs> I'm not of the pack anymore hallelujah this is why the world hates you not only the world hates you the world hates you also because the world is at war with Christians 
John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Wait a minute. There's a war with the world. You will. They didn't say you might. You will have tribulation. I'm trying to help somebody now. Because if I'm a pastor, you, you got to know that there's going to be some heat. You can't sit and say, if I do everything right, everything going to be smooth. Everything not going to be smooth. As a matter of fact, uh, you so on fire, I guarantee you that everybody got some kind of attack on their life right now. Everybody got some kind of attack. Now, we don't sit and talk about the attacks. It's just like, uh, uh, what, who was your favorite team that played yesterday? They don't sit and talk about every tackle they got tackled. We sit and talk about, yeah, they tackled us, but we got touchdowns. Yeah, they tried to stop us, but we got first downs. We tried to stop, but we had a victory. He said, you will have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. Don't worry about it. I've already won the match. If you're going to be in this world, the world is at war with God. But don't worry, I have overcome the world. Are you all with me? The next reason why the world hates you is that the world is a natural enemy against God. James 4, 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The world is the natural enemy against God. This is why we don't enjoy the world's music. This is why I increasingly, I increasingly find myself still in consecration mode because I just don't watch much television. Because most of the stuff on the TV, even from the early days, are anti-Christ. Especially the stuff that's supposed to be black shows, they just go overboard. I don't know why. I don't know what happened. I mean, we just go all in, man. We're going to have a gay scene. It's going to be a real gay scene. We're going to have a sex scene. It's going to be a real sex scene. We're going to kill someone. We're going to shoot them 30. Da, 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 da. Could you just shot them once and let a little blood come out of his mouth? No, he got to splatter all over everywhere. I just can't, I can't celebrate. So I found myself withdrawing because to be a friend with God makes me an enemy. A friend with the world makes me an enemy with with God, how can I enjoy people who knowingly are worshiping demons, but their music is good? I mean, they tell us that I'm worshiping demons, but we say, but no, but he's talented. Of course he's talented. How, how can we show our children uh, movies that we know have demonic backgrounds to it because the pixels are better and the art is better? Oh, but it's so artistic and you know it's so much better. Do you really think your four-year-old know about the pixels? And your 13-year-old too. Well, you know what? Yup, it got less pixels, but I tell you what, you'll have less demons. <laughs> Adulterers and adulteresses is not talking about sex with someone. It's talking about cheating on God. Are you cheating on God? You cheating on God, listening to all kinds of witches motivating you? A lot of the motivational speakers are witches. Lord have mercy. Witches, oh, and warlocks. Let me make that clear. Warlocks and witches, men and women. Many of the motivational speakers talking about, oh, if you just, if you could just see and create your vision and just create, if you can see it, you can realize it. Of course, you hear preachers saying that too. You know, some witch preachers. If you can, whatever you see, you can make it happen. You can create your reality and you can call it into existence and you can lift it up and you're great. And the, the law of attraction and your law of attraction, whatever is in you attracts others. And you can just see that and, and go into the ether and you can send thoughts to others. And you're like, whoa, I'm going to get promoted. You're going to get promoted, but you've made yourself an enemy with God. When we decide that for God, I live and God, I die. When we decide that I'm going to do things the way of God, it won't even be popular in church circles. How many of us heard from people that go to other churches that was mad at you because we were still in revival and they didn't come one night? They didn't come one night. They barely stayed on the live stream. Were y'all still in church? Y'all, when y'all go in that revival, I'd be glad when y'all stop. Why you be glad when we stop? Why are you worried about us going to church? 
Why are you mad at me for going? I'm just, whoo, <laughs> that's just a, whoo, <laughs> y'all, <laughs> y'all still going to church? Like, <laughs> therefore, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I don't want to be entertained by the world. I don't want to, I don't want to compromise for the world. If it calls making a compromise, Lord, help me to stand. I don't know what's in me. You don't know what's in you until you're tested. But I'll just say this, Lord, help me that when I, whatever test that I have to face before me, that I will not bow to be a friend of the world, that I will stand. Don't count it strange that there are people of God. There are people of God who will be tested in things. And, and we can easily say, oh, he must have deserved it like Job's friends did. Oh, it, what, what happened to you? You must have deserved that. You, what did you do? If you was praying, what, nothing bad would happen to you. Where did you get that from? Who told you that if you prayed, everything was going to work out all right? Who told you if you prayed that your business was going to thrive? Who told you if you prayed that your marriage was going to be all right? There's going to be some challenges. But one thing, I'm not, I don't have to make an alliance with the world. It's okay when a boat is in the ocean, but when the ocean gets in the boat is when you had a problem. And right now we have a problem because we got too much ocean in our boat. And the people don't want you to mention it. Just act like it's okay. But we all know we got water up to our hips, but we want to act like the boat is all right. Man overboard. <laughs> Pass over the ship. Why else, uh, why else do the world hate us? The world hates us just for the reason I just said. Christians live segregated from the world. We live segregated. We live a different life. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. I talked about the music. I talked about the entertainment. It's something in me that for years now, I watch so much less sports than I used to. Because sports is one of the great distractions. Oh, sports is, it got quiet now. Sports is one of the great distractions. Some folks that would have came back tonight, but they team playing. They would have came back, but they team playing. And know the interesting thing is, it's interesting that y'all can tell me people's stats, how many shots, I mean, how many points, rebounds, assists, how many, how many touchdowns, and how many this. And you can tell me, you, you name the person, you can run the line. But then I ask you to quote a scripture, book, chapter, verse, and you don't know none. Now tell me, don't just tell me the scripture, don't paraphrase. Tell me the scripture and where exactly is his address in the Bible, you don't know nothing. That's asking too much. That's extreme to have me. Don't you know how old I am? I'm 34 years old. I can't be memorizing like I did when I was 14. I, I just went nice in the middle somewhere. I'm that age. I can't memorize like I did. But you can remember everything else. You can remember that, that the woman just got an Academy Award. You cried with her because she did. She finally got an Academy Award. And let me tell you who else got Academy Award. And you can tell me all oh, the first black Negro that got Academy Award. And this one got first woman got. I don't know how you can say first woman anything because in America there's no such thing as a woman anymore. But first woman that got Academy Award and the first this that got Academy Award. You can tell me all that. And then I say, tell me, tell me three scriptures and tell me where they at in the Bible. Now that's how. John 3, 16. Psalm 23, 1. And then, and then I'd be hard-pressed to open my Bible and say, quote it, and quote it right. Hallelujah. Those who become friends of the world. But then Christians live a segregated, Christians live segregated from this world. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord, that's us that are saved, and through our knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. If we get entangled again, our end will be worse than it was before. If you go back to the things that you were in, you better stay separate. You go back, you go back to those things, whatever they are, you're going to find yourself in deeper trouble than you were before. Now, we're in the world, but not of the world. That's true. We can't, we, I wish the Lord would come back and take us away now. I wish the rapture would come just like in the next five minutes. Just get me to the altar call, Lord. I wish the rapture would come right now, but it's, I don't know if it will or not. But, we're, but if we're here, we're in 
in the world, but not of the world. But if we get ourselves entangled in them, in them and overcome, the latter end is worse. If we get entangled back in the things that we were in before, we find ourselves in trouble. So we got to stay segregated from the world. And the final reason that I have why the world hates Christians and why the world hates uh, the, the world hates you is that they don't know God. Finished story. They don't know God. I got a news flash for you. Everybody that's pastoring don't know God. I got a news flash for you. Everybody that goes to church don't know God. I know that's the truth. There are a lot of people who pastor. And first of all, there's no pastoral regulation board that stops you from starting a church. So anytime Dick and Harry can get a building and open up a church down the street. So uh, don't, don't come and ask me to vouch for somebody down the street who I haven't even vetted. <laughs> ask me to answer for somebody I haven't even vetted who's down the road. Everybody to open up a church is not a pastor. Hallelujah, son. Amen. And the funny thing is, is that when you have real pastors, you find that people don't love and appreciate those kind of guys. They like the fake folks. They like the folks that just, you know, just say whatever and play games and moonwalk. And they say, oh, now he all right. He can motivate me. But they don't know God. There's a whole world that don't know God. John 15, 21. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know him who sent me. There are those who would not like you because that now these are now if I use a church example, there are some who will tell you, I remember a preacher. I was asking a preacher just a question. I was a young minister and I wanted to know, tell me about your fast life. Tell me what do you do to get close to God, especially before you preach? How's your fast life? And he looked at me and said, what do you tell? You don't do all that no more. You don't do that. Man, I eat before I preach. I eat after I preach. I eat all the time. And I said, but but fasting, what, what about? And I was really because I looked up to this guy I thought he was something but tell me about you I'm no I'm uh, okay okay uh, maybe you know maybe I don't know but tell me about your fast life and he just totally dismissed that and told me I was extreme because he didn't know God how many of you been told by somebody you thought knew God but they started talking different than what you see in the Bible talking to somebody you thought knew God and they started telling you it don't take all that you thought, you thought they knew God, but they were saying things. These things they do for my name's sake. See, this is not somebody out in the world. These are people in the world that hate you that's in here. They do it for Jesus' sake because, uh, for, against them because they do not know him who sent me. They don't know God. So if they don't know God and they don't respect God, you just better expect they're going to come at you sideways. Who you think you are, who you are talking this stuff, that old stuff, that crazy stuff. But God is saying even right now, I'm going to show myself strong. And, that, and that's why the, 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 the apostle said that I may know him, that I may know him, that I may have an intimate relationship with him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering to, may be, to be made conformable unto him and then the final thing that I want to just share with you so so let's just look real again first of all we are commanded to love one another we must know that we are friends with God so we should have an open relationship with God and be able to share with him and we should be recognize and know that since we are friends with God that we are hated by the world you are hated by the world but that's okay because the world has been overcome by God that, that, that the world system hates you the world system hates the fact that tabernacle exists I, and I want to bring this real home there 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 is a demonic system that hates that we exist and we thrive here and they're working against us Hallelujah. Y'all need to know that. I don't know who they is, who they, who they is. I don't know who they are. I don't know what their names are. I don't know where they are, all of this kind of thing. I, I, brother so-and-so, there's some who look like us and act like they like us. They done sent folks up here to scout us out, to see who here, see who what. They're watching it. Some of them watching it. Everybody watching the live stream ain't with us. Everybody that come up in here ain't with us. I, I may be happy-go-lucky, but I ain't just stupid and naive. I know there's some folks that come around that ain't really with us, but I don't fear it. Oh, hallelujah. They'll come. They're not with us because they don't like the fact that this church exists because for every reason I just gave. Every reason, I, what's your secret, Matthews? How do y'all, how y'all church grow? Give me three easy steps. Pray fast. 
Lay before the Lord. See God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got that. We got that. Give me the other stuff. Where the gravy at? Pray fast. Lay before the Lord. Yeah, yeah. But what's the, what's the, the, the model? Pray fast. Lay before the Lord. <laughs> but see, you don't have to walk around looking to see who's praying against you, what spook is behind what door, what, what witch is flying with big birds at night sitting in your backyard. You don't have to look and look for omens and all kinds of other things and who trying to vex me and who got into the restaurant and put something in my food. You don't have to worry about all that because what shall we then say? If if God is for us, who can be against us? We don't walk with pride, but we walk and say that we're friends with God. And as we're friends with God, we can stand firm upon the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I got a few ways that we can love one another and show love to each other. I was going to share this with you. Other, I talked about it earlier. We're going we're gonna to fight to have our family life groups. Because we need to continue to link with one another in homes. Now, I know folks who say, I don't know about that. We ain't did that at my other church. Well, this ain't the other church. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it just like the book of Acts does. We're going to meet together in homes. We are scattered all around the tri-state area. And then we have people all across the country. And so whether White Haven, South Haven, Clarksdale, Senatobia, Millington, South Memphis, North Memphis, East Memphis, Cordova, Nesbitt, Oxford, Bartlett, Chicago, Detroit, Dallas, St. Louis, Atlanta, wherever it may be, that we will have groups there where people who are near can come together and sanctify and strengthen one another but I'm gonna tell you another reason why we're doing this I'm gonna tell you this and I hope somebody that's listening will take it because there's gonna come a time and I don't know when where it might be illegal for us to come together here now I hope y'all hear what I'm trying to say and if we're centralized and the only place we gather is here we're in trouble there's going to be a time because, you know, everything we do on Zoom and everything we do on Blue Jeans is recorded and monitored. Everything you do is monitored. You do know that, right? Because when you got that cell phone and you wanted to post on Facebook, they said we asked for permission to use your camera. When you want to do a live, doesn't that happen on your phone? We asked for permission to use your microphone. Once you gave permission to somebody to use their microphone, they can cut it on at any time. And record whatever you're doing and whatever you're saying. <laughs> you accepted those terms when you got TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat. You accepted those terms. You didn't read them. You just scrolled down and accepted. it. So they can cut on your mic at any time and listen to whatever you're doing. You're being monitored. You do know that, right? <laughs> And so there will come a time soon, there will come a time soon when we will not be able to gather on Facebook or on, on not Facebook, on Facebook like we are now. There will be a time soon, I don't know when, I believe I'll still be alive, that we won't be on Zoom because they'll say this is hate speech they're doing on Zoom, praying in the name of Jesus, the one who doesn't, doesn't believe in 3,500 genders. How can you pray in the name of Jesus who doesn't believe in 3,500 genders? How can you pray in the name of Jesus who believes there's only one way to God? How can you pray in the name of Jesus who doesn't believe that it's okay for you to kill your baby? How can you pray in the name of Jesus who doesn't believe, who doesn't believe, who doesn't believe? Because we have backed up as a church. And so we got to be decentralized to the point where we know where each other are. That's what they did in the book of Acts. And we can strengthen one another. But then if that doesn't happen... It gives us an opportunity to link with one another, love one another who are in our communities where we are. And then when we come back, we're stronger. The larger the church becomes, the smaller the church is. Y'all get what I'm saying? See, I expect, about, I expect hundreds of more people to join the church. And some people are afraid. Ooh, I don't want to be a part of a big church. What you want to do? Chase some folks out? Send them back out to the world? No. We, I don't want to be part of no big church. I don't want to be part of no big church. Well, I don't want to be part of nothing that's, that's dying dead or chasing folks out of a revolving door either. Yeah. 
And so what happens is that the church becomes smaller as it becomes bigger because we stay connected because we're connected in geographical groups. And then we come together. At least you know people. You can't get swallowed up. This is what I know it works. And so our life groups will help us to love one another and spend time with one another. Then our vulnerable family ministry that I mentioned earlier, some of you signed up and some of you, you're here in the first service. I need five teams of five to serve one family a week that's vulnerable. We're going to get referrals from the school social work workers, social workers uh, uh, from the city and from the police. And when there's families that are in need, families that may be about to lose their children because of neglect due to uh, poverty, they didn't pay a bill or they don't have certain things, we want that group to go that week and love on them and disciple them and bless them and be the love of God. I want, I, I'm praying that, that 25 people should be small and then team A, B, C, D, E, E will be the alternate group. And then this week, this is your week, and then you'll be able to go on the computer and see what the social workers get gave us and be able to pick one of those needs and say we're going to take care of this one then we're going to we're going to we got uh funding we got funding to be able to pour the money to go and then you all will go shopping and buy the baby bed or go buy the, the clothes or the milk that they need and go to that home and pray with them and love on them and encourage them and strengthen them and show them the real need that they have in Christ through the love of Christ. I believe that is us being the church and going out and helping the world to be able to see the love of God. And finally, I told you earlier, I need more sanctuary ushers to serve once a month. I need 20 of y'all because as people come in, I need that order. I need that excellence, and I need those things. And so how can we love one another and show love to the world? These are three of many of the ways. I, I can't go through all the ministries. This is kind of a help wanted list right here. This is kind of help wanted. We need some help in these things. If you live in one of those areas, you say, my home is available, and I can have seven to eight people because once it gets more than eight or nine, we split it because we don't want to have church. We want to have time where people can sit and and talk to each other and testify to each other and encourage one another, get to know one another and be to sit with one another about an hour a week at the homes. I know it works because I've done it before. We did it before here. We tried it with uh, activities. The problem was everybody got more excited about the activities and there wasn't a lot of Christian fellowship of helping to build one another up. So we can still have the activities at other times, but this is hugely important that you meet in these ways. I'm gonna, we're going to send you uh, a, a, a link this week over, the, uh, over your phone and in your email for you to sign up, for you to sign up. If you want to be part of the Family Life group and I'm willing to, to be a part in my area, we'll ask where do you stay. We pretty much know if you're part of the church already what area you're in. I want to be a part. I'm in South Memphis. I'm in Whitehaven. I'm in Horn Lake or wherever. I didn't list everywhere on here. If I didn't list your city, don't feel bad, or your area. I just listed a few places. It would be a long list, and it's not the sign-up. But I want to be a part of it. I'm signing up. I want to volunteer my home to meet once a week for an hour, five to eight people. And then once it gets bigger, it'll split to another home, and you'll have two in that area. And we'll have in different areas, and it'll be straight. Some of us drive from distances. And then what happens is you can even invite your neighbor and come meet people from the church and have a have a biscuit and some Kool-Aid. Amen. Ain't nothing wrong with biscuit and Kool-Aid with a little butter on the biscuit. Have biscuit and Kool-Aid. Nothing major. You don't have to have nothing for that matter. And then as they meet your friends from the church and hear the discussion, we grow together and they ended up coming to know God. Just Hello, everybody. I am so excited. I thank God for the Tabernacle Church. Tabernacle Church of God in Christ here in South Haven is one of God's miracles. This is a huge miracle. It was December 2019 that God said start a church. We didn't know where, we didn't know how, and for sure we didn't know that COVID was coming. God gave us the plan of church. We had obstacles looking around the entire metro area, but God led us here to South Haven. It was a God thing. But then COVID hit. We didn't know what to do, didn't know how to do it, but God showed himself. We began this church really as an outreach, giving out 6,000 boxes of food a week. We went beyond that, 6,000 boxes of food a week, to then being able to start services. June 2020, 
in the midst of the pandemic, we began services Sunday nights. Then October 2020, we began services in this building. We took full possession, full schedule, serving, and now God is accelerating doing the work. We are a part of a great miracle. There are great people of God. It's beyond my comprehension what God is doing. But now, if it, what God has done in the past few years, he wants to take us to the next level. I believe in this season, there's divine acceleration. And as God is accelerating the church, he's accelerating the lives of God's people so that we can be a blessing. We want to pay this place off. We owe it's $10 million worth of property, 17 acres, 100,000 square feet, 850 parking spaces. But God wants to do even more, not just to have church for church sake, but to be open every day, a beacon to the community community, a light. We, once we pay this place off, we're going to launch our Christian school K through 12. Take our children out of the mouth of the dragon and educate and raise up soldiers. We're going to also build on this side of the church building, a senior apartment facility. Yes, at least 200 units where our seniors will be able to stay and we'll be able to minister and share. And at the lower level will be a place for businesses. And one of the things will be a restaurant, a healthy restaurant to feed our people so that we can be healthy. In addition to that, God is going to free us up to utilize his resources to have a pregnancy center on this side. Yes, prenatal care to make sure our mothers are well taken care of, to prevent abortions. Those who feel like there's no other hope but abortion will have prenatal care, uh, postnatal care to prevent from infant mortality and uh, care for childbirth to prevent from the crisis of morbidity during childbirth. In addition to that, the gym on the other side, we're going to have it as a wellness a health and wellness center where there'll be uh you won't have to go to lifetime fitness but that we can focus on the health of people things in addition to that our bible training center where people will be able to earn degrees from associates all the way through to doctors all of this is already in motion in addition to that our youth center youth activity center which will be above the gym our senior activity center which will be this is actually started now which is starting here in the church and finally our record label there are so many things that are happening it's so great that what god is doing and the beautiful thing is once we leverage that and leverage the land that god has given us all of these things are already set in motion through partnerships we won't have to raise any more money we won't have to do anything god is going to do a miracle in this place in our homes and our lives and I'm excited to be a part of the miracle.